at Jones Gap State Park. We've got the beautiful Middle Saluda River flowing behind us that's full of trout. But today we're going to talk all about what you would need to go out and trout fish. I'm joined by Kevin Kubach, who's one of our freshwater fisheries biologists out of the Clemson office. So, Kevin, if we're going to go out and we don't know anything about trout fishing, how do we need to dress to get into one of these streams? Well, trout are naturally cold water fish, so it's a good idea to wear waders, especially during the cooler months. Um, you have a couple options. You can either wear chest waders, and especially if you're wearing chest waders, you're going to want to make sure you have on a wading belt, a uh, really key safety piece of equipment here for, for deeper water. In case you were to fall in, this prevents water from filling up your waders. In shallow streams, you can get away with hip waders. And during the summer months, and really in South Carolina, probably four or five months of the year, you can wet wade, which is a very nice thing to do. Um, just put on an old pair of wading boots or, or old boots in general, maybe a pair of uh, wading pants, and you can just uh, hike through the stream and, and have a good time out there. Excellent, so we've got the clothing down. Now, what other things would we need to have on us? We can't have a tackle box like other anglers would in right. their boat or on the bank because we're actually in the stream. So how do we get our gear out there? Exactly. As you can see, trout fishing entails a lot of gear, and uh, a vest is a handy way to store all of it. You can see lots of pockets here, a place to hold uh, a pair of hemostats to remove hooks, um, uh, line clippers, and all your flies, uh, rooster tails, any small pieces of gear that you might need while trout fishing, you can store them in a vest or alternately a uh, chest pack. These are great if you're doing like a day hike. You just need to keep a few things in there. Um, real convenient. Has a place to put all your flies and maybe a snack or two. It's pretty neat. So you don't necessarily have to carry it all on your back or on your vest if no, you don't want to. No. There are other means of That's ways to do that. a great option for just a light, you know, uh, small stream headwater hike or something like that. Now what about this handy net over here? We don't definitely don't want to lose the things that we you catch. You do not want to lose trout. They're, they're, too, they're too pretty to lose at the end and not get a picture of. So these, these fine mesh soft nets are great. Trout don't have spiny fins, so you don't really have to worry about the, the sharp spines tearing up the net or anything like that. And this is pretty good on their scales, not too rough. And where would an angler carry something like this if he's toting in a rod and... You can hook it right onto your vest or, or your pack or even some people just tuck it right into their wading belt or if okay. you're wet wading, just stick it right in your belt and it works out pretty well. They're nice and light. So very easily accessible so we don't lose that fish when exactly. we land them. Exactly. So a couple other things that I think um, are important and they're important in any fishing are these things right here. Absolutely. Polarized sunglasses are a key piece of equipment for any angler. I think most people um, realize the benefit of being able to see your lure, see where you're casting, cut that glare off of the water. And especially in, in trout fishing, if you're fly fishing or spin fishing, just being able to see exactly where your lure is in a complex flowing stream really helps. So those glasses do a great job of cutting the glare. So they kind of give us a, a heads up to where those trout might be hiding out exactly, in the pool. Exactly, exactly. And where exactly we need to place that lure. Right. Another handy thing is that hat you have on. It is. It, it, in conjunction with the fishing glasses, it's a, a great way to, to keep the sun right out of your face and let you kind of see that action out in front of you a lot not, better. Not to mention if you were on the trout stream with a rookie like me that you'd want to wear <laughs> that hat and those sunglasses to protect those eyes That's from true. A, stray flies a, and a stray hook. <laughs> So we've talked about what we should wear. Now we've got several different types of rods and reels on the table. You know, when people think about trout fishing, they strictly think about these things right here, these right. fly rods. Right. It's that, that image of trout fishing is often associated with fly fishing, and it's just one of many ways you can fish for trout in South Carolina. Um, fly rods are typically longer than, than spinning rods. This is an eight and a half foot rod here. And the difference, the main difference is that you're casting something that's almost weightless most mm -hmm. of the time. So rather than the line, uh, rather than the lure carrying the line out, you're actually casting the fly line. Fly line is thick and, and buoyant, and you're, you're, you're actually throwing the, the line, which just then carries the fly. Um, in, in South Carolina, you can get away with a, a five weight rod in most situations. That's a good middle of the line uh, fly rod weight. They're rated from 0 to 10, 11, 12, even for big saltwater applications. But for most freshwater trout, a five-weight rod or four-weight rod is perfect. You can go a little bit smaller, too. This is a two-weight rod here. It's great for small wild trout in settings like the one we're in now. Um, 
you know, makes a nice nine inch rainbow feel like, like something special when you hook it. So again, uh, two weight, three weight rods are also fun to fish with in South Carolina. Excellent. There's a, a big difference with going to a trout shop to pick out some line versus going picking out line for bass or brim because you've got several different types of line on one reel. Right. Um, I know you can see right here, we've got the bright yellow is the backing. That's correct. And the backing purpose is to make sure that when we catch that fly, we've still got something left, catch that trout, we've still got something left on the reel, right? Right. If you Really, backing is if you hook into a big fish and you're in big water and, and it decides to run on you. Fly line typically is only about 80 to 90 feet long. So if a fish makes a run longer than that, you need something else on there to help you, you know, fight that fish. And, and that's what the backing is for. Typically, you have 100 yards of backing on your reel, too. So if you, if you get into a Just big fish and case. it really takes off, you've got something to, to try to slow it down with. And then I see we've got two different colors here as far as the line. We've got the actual fly line, and then we've got something that looks like monofilament. That's right. This is the, the fly line is the uh, olive color here, and then it transitions into a leader, and the leader is a long tapered piece of, of monofilament, typically from 7 to 13 feet long, depending on the conditions that you're fishing, and it tapers down to uh, a, a wide range of tippet sizes, they're called. And depending on whether the, the fish are real spooky, or if you can get away with a thicker line, you know, you, you can adjust it accordingly, and that's what you actually tie your fly onto is the end of the tippet. Okay, yeah. very neat. So the fly line just carries the fly out there and that tippet is, is the clear part so the fish don't see the line obviously. So that seems a little intimidating so if I were starting out and I didn't necessarily want to use a fly rod and reel I could then turn to something that I'm more familiar with. Exactly. Spin fishing is a great way to fish for trout. Um, ultralight spinning rods like these are perfect. You can tie on a 1 8 ounce or 1 16 ounce rooster tail. That's a great lure. Uh, for most trout streams, um, shallow streams and rivers, those are perfect. You can kind of cast them across the current and reel them back, you know, and, and trout are pretty aggressive with those. Usually they'll come out and, and hit them much like a panfish or a bass would. Well, that's good to know. So if I get really frustrated with the art of fly fishing, I can turn to my, my handy dandy spinning rod that exactly. I, I'm more comfortable with. Exactly. So when we're trout fishing, we have a variety of things and situations. We've got really small streams like the Middle Saluda behind us in South Carolina. Right. We have the wide Chattooga. Yep. And then we have places like Lake Jocassi where we've got a lake situation. So it's pretty unique in South Carolina that we can fish for trout in a variety of ways. Which it is. means we need to have a variety of things in our tackle boxes depending on where we're going to go. Correct. So let's start out on a stream like the Middle Saluda. Well, what will we use? This is primarily uh, you could spin fish here, but fly fishing works really well in these shallow streams with a lot of pocket water like you see behind us, just these little small pockets, most of which hold trout. Um, you've got a lot of different flies to choose from, as you can see here. Nymphs are a class of fly that are intended to be fished below the surface, and you usually fish these with a little bit of weight. You can get split shot, just like you would use with uh, fishing with crickets, you know, for brim mm -hmm. or something like that. Put a little piece of that on, maybe eight inches above the fly, and some of the flies already have uh, beads on them, as you can see here, which helps get the fly down. You're going to fish these below the surface. They're intended to imitate aquatic insects that are drifting under the water or, have, or are crawling along the bottom or have emerged and are on their way to the surface. Trout sit in these lanes and feed on these things all day long. And so you're just going to want to cast that up into the, the, the prime run and let it drift back along. You can use the fly fishing equivalent of a bobber, which mm -hmm. is called a strike indicator. You see a couple varieties of those here. You just keep your eye on that. When you see it twitch or stop or change direction, much like fishing for brim, just set, set the, the hook. hook. Exactly. So those are, that's primarily the way you fish with nymphs. Okay, so those would be subsurface. Subsurface, exactly. Okay. Um, then a lot of the year as well, aquatic insects are hatching out, flying off to mate and coming back to the water to lay their eggs in order to imitate adult insects at those various life stages, you use dry flies. And I have a couple boxes of dry flies here. Pass one over. These are intended to float. So you can put floating on these and cast them out and, and hopefully they'll stay on the surface. You just watch them drift through, try to keep the water from pulling unnaturally on the fly. You want to make it as uh, natural a drift as possible. And you just keep your eye on that dry fly. In the southeast, Trout are not too picky. 
it's more about presentation uh, rather than pattern. So the key things are just having a fly that you can see, that the angler can see when it's on the water, and one that floats well because you're dealing with a lot of intricate currents and they're going to push that fly around. You want something that's going to stay on the top of the water and allow the angler to see it for most of its drifts. So you can just watch the trout come up and take it. That's, that's a lot of fun. So if you're using a um, dry fly like this, who's pretty fluffy, you have right. to put the float, flotation stuff on it to keep it going. Right. And do you have to reapply that when you're using these lures? You do occasionally. It's, it's one of those things you kind of do it as needed. If you're fly, if you're casting a lot, that'll help dry the fly out. If you're in a close quarters situation, you're just doing a little uh, dead drift, you know, you're, you're watching your fly, you might not really sink the fly a whole lot. So if, if a lot of fish are biting and pulling it under, which is a good thing, then you probably have to reapply floating periodically. And then I just get a little blow on it to fluff them, fluff exactly. them back you up. Exactly, you just rub it on there and, and dry the fly off a little bit and you're good to go. Very neat. A third class of, of fly, and, and as you can see, these are a lot larger than most of the other types we have here. Uh, these are called streamers, and trout, people think of trout as eating all these small aquatic insects, which they do, but they also like to eat fish and other larger critters that live in the stream, like crayfish. That's what these are intended to imitate, and you usually cast these out. They're pretty well weighted um, already, as you can see. A lot of them have uh, maybe eyes on them or a, a bead up front that helps get the fly down. You're going to cast this out and just strip it back through, make it look like a, a fish darting through the river, something like that. These are great to use on larger trout, especially brown trout, which really like to eat other fish. Okay, so, can, I, can I see one absolutely. of those? Absolutely. I would love to, um, it's pretty neat. So do you make your own flies? I tie some. Mm -hmm. It's a very fun element of the sport. It's, it's really rewarding when you catch a fish on, on a fly that you've tied. So. so you can change up eye color and? Eye color, the material. A lot of these flies use material from uh, turkeys, pheasants, a lot of game birds, so if you're a hunter, that's another thing you can do is try to get yourself a turkey, tie flies with it and go catch a trout. I'm still trying to do that myself. I haven't <laughs> been successful on the turkey front, but. Very neat. So those are all the different types of flies that you would need in your arsenal to uh, go exactly. out there and catch a good trout. So what do we have here in the middle? Oh, this is a box of inline spinners, primarily rooster tails, which we discussed earlier. These are great to use with ultralight spinning rods. And again, you can cast those out across the current, bring them back, and, and again, they, they imitate fish, primarily crayfish, things that are on the move in the stream, actively swimming. We also have some little jigs here. Uh, these are called trout magnets, and it's just a, you know, a little jig head that you put a grub tail on, and they're perfect as well. You can run these below an indicator or a bobber, if you want to call it that, and put a little split shot on there and just let that thing drift through the stream, and they're great flies where, you know, and they come in a variety of colors also. Exactly. I really like some of these inline spinners over here. They actually imitate um, some of the flies that you mentioned. These look they like do. dry flies. They do. They're, they look like dry flies, but you can fish those. You can kind of run them just under the surface or, or down below the surface and that get that blade turning and it, the flash draws the fish over and then they see the, the actual you know, lure there and they're very effective as well. Some of these imitate, like this one looks kind of like a, like a grasshopper something of that nature. That's another key thing with trout fishing is up in these small streams, fish eat a lot of things that fall out of the trees. It's a very important source of food for them. Not all the critters that they eat come from within the stream. So grasshoppers, ants, we call these terrestrials, are great flies to use spring through fall. When those things start to get active, ants are falling in the stream all the time, grasshoppers, so it's very useful pattern. You had to tie your own ant fly, that would have to be really tiny. Some of them are pretty <laughs> tiny and uh, you know this, these tiny flies are hard to see when you're when you're using them but one thing you can do in fly fishing is attach a small fly to another fly so you'll have your line going to a big bushy dry fly and then have that dropped off to an ant maybe 10 inches below and you can just keep your eye on the big fly when you see it move you know something may have taken the smaller fly. So that's so another technique. The ant fly would be under the surface and your dry fly would be floating exactly, on top. Exactly, a, so dry, dry, fly a dry, dry dropper work, is what you call that. Would work as a strike indicator, so Exactly, it gives you two options as well, you know, two, two food types for the fish to choose from, maybe increase your chances a little bit of hooking up with a trout. Very neat. So we do have two other lures. You mentioned crayfish earlier. This is something that we could also use with a spinning rod? Exactly, I don't know any game fish that doesn't like to eat crayfish, and, and trout are no exception, so 
Uh, crayfish pattern's a great idea when trout fishing. You can cast that across and, and swim it right under the surface or down along the bottom. Like a crayfish that's fleeing from danger, that always seems to uh, get that aggressive instinct going in fish and they'll, they'll usually eat those. It's a very good key component in our aquatic ecosystems here in South Carolina. Absolutely, absolutely. Good food source. And then we have this really pretty rainbow plug. Right, diving plugs are also great to use in trout fishing. You know, might be more challenging in a shallow stream, but in deeper water, those are perfect. Cast them across the current and, and bring them back just under the surface or right along the bottom, and you're likely to get some hookups with trout. Excellent. So let's talk a little bit more about what that deeper water would entail. If we were on Lake Jocassee, we wouldn't necessarily use the fly rod and reel. You can fly fish in lake settings. It's a little bit more challenging, but a place like Lake Jocassee where the trout during the warmer months are going to be pretty deep, you're going to want to use some of these larger uh, lures that you see over here, some of these real deep diving plugs and spoons. I really like this one, this tiger. A lot of the stripe. folks that fish on Lake Jocassee go out in a boat and they'll use a downrigger to get that to swim at a certain depth and they'll troll around the lake until they get into the schools of trout and it's a great uh, type of lure. You know, it resembles the large fish in the lake that trout like to eat. Got a nice little flash with all the glitter and color and then also you've got the flash on the back exactly. side with that blade. We've got two more plugs for lake water. This right. one actually has a little Got a little flash to it on the tail there. Just adds another dimension to the lure, you know, make it a little more appealing maybe than a plain one. But and again, you can cast that out and let that run really deep in, in a lake setting or in a deeper river, and you're likely to get some, some strikes that way. So that one would be, would be a diving plug also with that bill on the front. Right. And then we have this really nifty broken plug or a split plug, right, whatever that jointed, you want to call it. Right, that jointed plug is another effective thing, and, and people think that that adds a lot of action to the lure, which it does. Um, you know, might it give it that extra little. edge, right? Make it imitate a swimming fish. So we've covered a lot of different types of lures that you can use for trout fishing. Um, everything from what we would need on a small stream with the flies to the larger lures for deeper water like Lake Jocassee. Right. It can seem a little frustrating, but if you guys want to get out there and try your hand at trout fishing, please do so. We have some helpful aids on our website with all about trout fishing specifically in South Carolina. You can go to www.dnr.sc.gov to download one of these books. We hope that you enjoyed our trout fishing lure segment and we will catch you guys next time.